And this is chapter five on variability. Talk about variability in distributions. Variability is simply the description of how different the scores are from one another. In a distribution, if something varies, it means that it differs from um, other things in some way. High variability means the scores are widely spread out across the distribution, and low variability means the scores are very similar and clustered around a middle value. And as you can see here, here's a scale that has very high variability. You can see the scores are basically distributed across the um, scales here. And then um, here's a scale that has very low variability. As you can see, the scores are very clustered around the mean. Both scales, notice, have a mean of five. So variability can be high or low regardless of what the mean value of the distribution is. Let's take a look at range and then interquartile range. Uh, range is simply just the difference between the highest and the lowest score in a distribution, and it's effect greatly affected by extreme scores. So if you have one person that scores seven on a scale and one person that scores one on a scale, um, and you're reporting the range as one through seven, that's very, um, can give you a very skewed uh, result of what the, the, the data is when in fact most people might have said five or four or something like that, if you had like a bunch of people that said five or four. But just reporting the range can give you sort of a misunderstanding of the data because you might think, wow, everyone, you know, the majority of people really were selecting, you know, one or seven when that wasn't the case. That's why the range, um, it says here, is greatly affected by extreme scores and is not really the best um, measure to report in terms of variability. It is useful, though, in terms of a measure of variability for discrete variables, and these are values um, that are whole numbers and cannot be further divided, for example, the number of kids. To find the range, you simply take your max score and subtract it from your min score, and that's going to give you the range. In the previous example, if you had seven and you subtract it from one, the top score and the lowest score, that would give you the answer of six, the range of six. Um, in the example that they give in the book, uh, they basically take the top score, which was 95, and they subtract it from the lowest score, which was 55, and that gives you a range of 40 points. In terms of calculating the interquartile range, we're going to review that next. And the interquartile range is simply the difference between the scores that mark the middle 50% of the distribution. So you're going to find the scores in the middle. You're going to eliminate the scores on the top, and you're going to eliminate the scores on the bottom. And uh, it can be used instead of a range for distribution with extreme scores. Um, however, so it's going to give you, you know, that middle instead of just reporting those extreme scores, which is better than the range, right? Um, but it's very, a fairly imprecise measure of variability because it really only includes the middle 50% um, of the scores in its calculation. It is very um, popular for when you see for college admissions from high school to college, for example, you'll see the ACT and the SAT, they report the middle 50% of the scores of people that were admitted. You might have seen that before. Um, it is a far better measure of variability, a far better measure rather of variability is um, the standard deviation, which we're going to review. Uh, after this. Um, as I said, it can be determined from the difference between the values where 25% of the scores are above the median, right here, and 25% are below. So you're going to subtract, you're going to find this value that is 25% above the median, and you're going to subtract it from the value that is 25% below the median. So you're going to find these two values. And that kind of says it right there. And to take this example again, um, what they did was they found the interquartile range, the end result being they subtracted 82.5, this value right here, which is at the 75% percentile or 25% above the mean. And then they subtracted 67.5, which is 25% below, uh, excuse me, I said the mean, below the median, excuse me. Okay. Um, the best way that I like to find it is you find your top and bottom scores for the middle 50% of scores. And to do this, simply divide the total of number of scores by four. So in this example in your book, you had 12 uh, total number of scores. So you divide by quartiles, right? Divide by four, and you get three. Then from your list of scores, 
you, you have all the list of scores right here, all these 12. And then what you do is you take the top three and you get rid of them. And then you take the bottom three and you get rid of them. And then the scores remaining that you'll have, you'll have six scores, right, out of 12 because you got rid of three and you got rid of three here. The scores that remain here, um, you'll take the top score, 82.5, and the bottom score, 67.5, and take the difference of those, and that's the inner quartile range of 15. Standard deviation, measure representing the average distance between the scores and the mean. So the average distance of the deviant, uh, or how, how much the, the deviants, the scores that deviate from the mean. Um, standard deviation tells us how measurements for a group are spread out from the average, from the mean. As you can see, the orange um, distribution curve right here, um, the standard deviation is very large, you can see right here. They're very spread out. And as you can see, the green one is nicely tightly packed here and has a lower standard deviation. And that is from data that you really like to see um, in a lot of research. Again, standard deviation is a measure representing the average distance between the scores and the mean. Okay, so you have the mean and they're gonna be average distance from how scores deviate this way and how scores deviate this way, right? However, you can't calculate the average distance. The positive and the negative difference between the scores and the mean will always be zero because remember, the mean is the balancing point where if you take these scores in the positive that move from the positive area from the mean and you take the scores that move below the mean and you add them together and they're gonna equal zero. And that's why you use um, the solution for the variance and you square um, the differences and um, that way it takes away the minus um, and plus signs, if you will, or the minus sign. And then you're gonna take the square root later. Um, the solution, of course, is to remove the direction of the differences from the mean by squaring the differences between the score and the mean in our calculation, which is called the sum of squares. Then taking the average of that, of that, which is the variance. Then taking the square root of the variance, which will get you to the standard deviation. So that's just summing up what the process that I'm gonna, kind of a four or five step process that I'm gonna go through next. The standard deviation is reported more often in research than the range or interquartile range, and it's used in inferential statistics to estimate the sampling error. And so what you're gonna find is the mean and the standard deviation, the last two chapters, kind of those key concepts that we've covered, are gonna be immensely helpful for you in understanding inferential statistics and using inferential statistics. And um, one way is going to help you estimate sampling error. You're gonna use that to estimate sampling error. And we already talked about that. And the other way is through hypothesis testing when trying to figure out if your intervention, for example, made a difference. I like to use the famous caffeine study, right, where you're measuring people on a memory test of people that were caffeinated versus not caffeinated. And you're gonna look at the difference in their scores. And if their scores are much different, then you're gonna ask like how much difference are they and that, is that statistically significant? And you're gonna be able to test your hypothesis. Um, you're gonna look at the probability of the data you found came from the distribution of sample means. So if you look at a normal, standard normal distribution of distribution of all sample means, okay? Let's say that's this right here. Then you say, let's say you get a curve where your mean is, let's say two standard deviations from the population mean or the control group mean. So you have a bell curve that's like this, okay? You're gonna be able to say with a certain probability that that did not come from the control group. And in fact, these are different people. These are different people by virtue of the fact that they took caffeine, which is the variable that you're studying. And so fun stuff of calculating the standard deviation by hand, right? Uh, so what you wanna first do is calculate the deviations from the mean. And the deviations equal the scores that you have, all of your scores, minus the mean. So you have to figure out what your mean of the data is first, of course. In the example from figure 5.4 in your textbook, they give the mean, um, the, value, the value of the mean is 75. And then they give you all these scores. So for each score, you're going to figure out your deviation. So for 55, it's 55 minus the mean, x with the bar over it is the mean. 55 minus 75 is minus 20, 
60 minus 75 minus 15, and so on. And then you've got your positive ones. And if you add all these up, it's going to equal zero, right? So that's why, now we found our deviations. That's why we're gonna square the deviations to take away the minus sign. And so we're gonna have, um, you know, not have them not cancel out to zero, right? And so we're basically squaring all these things, right? It's taking away the minus sign. But the squared deviations, that estimate, which is the variance or the average of that, really isn't going to give us that good of uh, information. So that's why we want to take the square root and give us the standard deviation. I'm stepping ahead. But next, what we're going to do is calculate the sum of squares. So right here, the sum of squares is represented as SS, and that equals you sum up um, the deviations, uh, the squared deviations. So from the example here, we're just going to add up our squared deviations, right? And that equals 1550. And then you're going to divide by N for the population to get the variance. So you're gonna divide by the total number of scores, which was 12. And so the variance, this is the population variance, the symbol for population variance right here, equals the sum of squares over N and the example from figure 5.4 is the sum of squares is 1550. Divide that by 12 and you get 129.17 is the population variance. Okay. And to get the standard deviation, you basically just take the square root of that population variance. And that gives you a much more intelligible figure than um, 129.17. And that is the standard deviation for the population. That's the symbol for the standard deviation for the population. The equation we just looked at is for the population standard deviation. I think I just said that, right? The sample will have fewer scores contributing to the variability. The variability of the sample will be lower than the variability of the population because we're not, we don't have as many scores. In order to correct for this fact, we use a term known as the degrees of freedom. And this is an important concept just for you to kind of remember because you'll encounter it later when you're using uh, certain inferential statistics. Degrees of freedom is simply the number of scores that can vary in a calculation of a statistic. Once we know the mean, for example, in our sample, um, we know the mean um, in that recent example, all the scores except for one of them can be of any value, uh, or excuse me, can be any value which means they're free to vary. So we do know the mean, so that's not free to vary, but all the other scores are free to vary. Um, and so uh, thus the degrees of freedom for a sample are one less than the number of scores, which is n minus one. So we'll always know, theoretically, we'll always know the mean, but we won't necessarily know the other scores. They can vary and give us the same mean. And so that's why we take it as n minus one and um, being the population minus one, the mean that we already know, which is not free to vary. Does not have a degree of freedom. Okay, next. Um, so the sample standard deviation is just like finding the population standard deviation, but instead of dividing by the 12, we divide by 11 here. Okay, so just notice that. That's, it's basically the same thing, the same equation except instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus one. Just a side note, SPSS gives you the sample standard deviation um, and won't give you the population standard deviation, so it must be transformed and you just use the equation that they give you in the book. Uh, the last part of the chapter goes over which measure of variability should you use. And it gives you a flow chart, which is pretty handy. Um, if you have a nominal variable, uh, variability cannot be really quanti it can't be quantitatively measured. So none are appropriate in terms of um, the variability variable measure. Um, taking a look at your scales of measurement, of course, um, you must consider ordinal interval ratio variables. You must consider the measure of central tendency that you use. Okay. So if you calculated the mean, um, for example, uh, with the interval or ratio variables, then you'll use the standard deviation always for your measure of variability. If you calculate the median or mode, you can use either the range or the interquartile um, range. 
Range is more affected by extreme scores, so if you have a lot of outliers, it's better to use the interquartile range. And this basically sums it up. Um, do you have a nominal measurement of scale? Yes, then you, you're out of luck. Don't use any measure of variability because you can't quantify those nominal measurement scales. And if you don't have a nominal measurement scale, then you ask yourself, of course, which measure of central tendency did you use? And if you use the mean, um, then you're going to be able to calculate your standard deviation. And if you use the median or mode, it's better to use the range or interquartile range. Um, I hope that helps you um, with understanding variability and the important concepts of range, interquartile range, and of course, standard deviation, which is gonna be a super uh, important topic with uh, the mean in uh, or important concept um, in descriptive statistic essentially um, with the mean for future chapters where we're going to be doing some hypothesis testing and inferential statistics. See ya.